I want to encourage everybody tonight. We're going to give you plenty of time to ask questions. And so tonight we're going to, we want you to understand the um, chapter 24 of Matthew. A prophecy can be so garbled up if you don't understand who's speaking to who and when and what it's about. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to talk about some of the myths about Matthew 24, uh, some of the truths about Matthew 24. And I want to talk about Israel is a fourfold plan of God. Israel has a fourfold plan. God has a fourfold plan with Israel. And so we're going to have a seat. Jimmy, it's good to have you. I'm glad to be here. Good old Baptist brother with me. Amen. Absolutely. Pastor of the First Baptist Church of Galena. Amen. Amen. If you can find Galena. If you can find Galena, I'm sorry. No, it's a good place. We had a revival there and the Lord blessed. And it was good. We had a great time. It was great. And... Um, the First Baptist Church of Galena has a great pastor, Brother Jimmy. He's an amazing man. Amen. And he is an incredible person. I love him. There's a reason why God doesn't make Jimmy any, uh, people like Jimmy any longer. <laughs> That's good, huh? I liked it. Can I, can I have a steak? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just... Just kidding. <laughs> I want to say a few things about Matthew 24, and there is so much confusion on it. I would like to say right from the get-go that as Jesus is about to come to Israel, his second coming to the earth with his church, it's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if we're seeing days like Sodom and Gomorrah now, and the days like Noah now, then so much closer is the catching away of the church because it happens before Jesus comes to earth to Israel. Absolutely. And so we need to understand the truths of Matthew chapter 24. This is a roundtable discussion. We're going to, Jimmy's going to pull me He's going to rescue me every now and then. And you, me. Okay. We're in trouble, are we? We're in it together. We're in trouble. We're going to have to bring Chris up here, Josh. I want to share this real quickly before we go into Matthew 24. And, and Israel has a fourfold, well, it's, it's God's fourfold plan. Israel, there's a fourfold plan with God through Israel. First of all, Israel is the center of all nations. Israel, not America. Israel is the center of all nations. Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5 says, Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and the countries that are round about her. So God placed Israel in the middle of the nations. Second, Israel is the center of salvation. Amen. My salvation came through the virgin-born Son of God, Jesus Christ, who just happens to be a Jew. And the fullness of the Godhead rested in him, and he is my Lord and my God. Amen. Jesus Christ said to the woman at Jacob's well in chapter 4, verse 22, you don't know who you worship because salvation is of the Jews. Jonah said in the belly of the fish, the well, chapter 2, verse 9, salvation is of the, the Lord. Lord. So Israel, first of all, is in the center of the nations. It's not America, it's Israel. That's why you need to keep your eye on Israel. And Israel is the center of salvation. Everything, this Bible came from Israel. Jesus, our Savior, is a Jewish Israel. So, and, I, and I realize people say, well, I, I don't believe that. Well, he wasn't. Jesus was not a Russian or a Chinaman or an American. He was a Jew. Yes. And he came by the way of the Virgin Mary. Jerusalem is the storm center of the world. Have you noticed that 
There's a lot of turmoil over in Israel right now. It's the storm center of the world. I will make you a cup of trembling. Yeah. And, and actually, it is God's war room. It really is. Jerusalem is the storm center of the world. I believe it's in Zechariah. You quoted at chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, that it would be a cup, a a cup trembling, of trembling and also a, a stone in which would be a bur burdensome, a burdensome stone, stone upon the nations. And then Jerusalem is also God's center of prophecy. Jerusalem is God's center of prophecy. It's not TBN, it's not... What's some of the others? CNN. PTL, that tells you how old I am. MSLSD. <laughs> prophecy headquarters is not in America. Prophecy headquarters is not here. God's center of prophecy is in Jerusalem. It's interesting that God put Israel in the middle of the nations. Then he put Jerusalem in the middle of Israel. And then he put the temple in the middle of Jerusalem. And if you notice, Pastor, uh, in all the prophecies, the Old Testament and the New, and they talk about, you know, king of the north and the king of the south and the kings of the east, these are all in relation to Jerusalem. And, uh, and when you study the old Talmud writers, the rabbis, uh, in the years even after Jesus, of course, unbelieving Israel, uh, the, they, they speak of Jerusalem as the center of the earth. Yes. So when he said north, he meant north of North of Jerusalem. Israel. South, south. Of, all prophecy is south, north, east, or west of Jerusalem. I always remember that. It's not northeast, south of America. It's from God's holy city. Now let's look at Matthew 24. And we'll read the first few verses because they're important that we see who is talking, what's being said here. Um, I looked at this and I was really blessed by what it said, and Jesus went out and departed, verse one, from the temple, and the disciples came to him, for he showed him, for to the, to, they showed Jesus the buildings of the temple. The temple was, the temple actually set on 36 acres on the top of Mount Zion. And on the top of Mount Zion, the temple went over 90 feet tall. It was a, when you looked anywhere in Israel, you would see this incredible temple that stretched into the heavens. And so the disciples told Jesus, look at the temple, how gorgeous it is. And in verse two, Jesus said unto them, see you not all these things? You see the temple, how beautiful it, how beautiful it is? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And the disciples were blown away because the disciples were Jews asking about a Israeli question. This is a question about Jesus ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. This is a question about Jesus coming as Messiah to Israel. A kingdom. Yeah, a kingdom, his kingdom. Verse three, and as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and saying, tell us. When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming of the end of the world? There's actually two questions there. What would be the sign? And, and you know, I think Jesus got really fed up with the Jewish people always wanting a sign. Sign, 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 everywhere a sign. Give me a sign. You know that song? I know that song. How's it go? I put my hair up under the hat and I went, went in to ask him why. And he said, you look like a fine young man. I think you'll do. And I said, so I pulled off my hat and said, imagine that, me working for you. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the signs? <laughs> <laughs> sign, sign, sign. <laughs> if you remember, Jesus Christ said to them, there'll be no sign to Israel except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For he Amen. said, as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, Matthew 12, 
So shall the Son of Man spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And by the way, the heart of the earth is not the grave. And so Jesus Christ said, that's the only sign you're going to get. And that sign is to the church, that sign to people that will listen to Jesus Christ. One sign, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those three go together. It's one great big sign. God loves you, and God is powerful, and God will deliver you. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. Amen. Absolutely. And so what we see here is the Jewish disciples are saying to Jesus, what should be the sign of your coming? When are you, when you going to take your throne? When are you going to take your kingdom? They're asking him a Jewish question. When are you going to become the king? Because in their mindset, the Messiah would come when, at a time of great tribulation, which was the Roman rule at that time when Jesus came. So they had that. Check, they just checked it off. You know, yep, tribulation. Time of Roman occupation. And then the forerunner, he came. And his name was John the Baptist. That's it. And he preached, he's coming. The king is coming. Prepare the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they thought that Jesus would come in a few days as Messiah and take his place. So they're not thinking, well, you know, the Lord will come in 2,000 years, 3,000 years. They're thinking, okay, Jesus, what's it going to be, about two weeks? What's it going to be, about a month at the most? And Jesus Christ said, no, the temple's going to be destroyed. They couldn't understand that. They couldn't wrap their mind around that. The temple's going to be destroyed. Titus 70 AD, 37 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Romans came in. Titus, the Roman, came in. They cut down the olive trees on the olive mount. They cut down olive trees. They put them in the temple. They kindled wood. They started a fire with the olive trees and the oil that was in those olive trees. It just combustible. The temple was stone. They had stones that were, oh, I don't know, 20,000 pounds apiece. And it was an incredible lime, white limestone temple. It was gorgeous. And so Titus put all these Trees, these olive trees, cut them down. There's a prophecy. You remember where that is? There was a prophecy about the trees being cut. Is it, is it in Zechariah? I can't it, remember, it James. Anyway, um, that's a good I'm study sorry. for everybody. But anyway, they cut down all the trees. They put them in the temple. They set them on fire. And the gold that was in the temple that was there for display of God's power, the gold melted because of the intense heat. The rocks cracked and the gold melted into the stones. And remember, Jesus Christ said there will not be one stone left upon another. And so the Roman soldiers come along after they burned it down. And they tore every stone apart one by one to get the gold that had melted into the temple foundation into the stone. That's, that's what happened. So in, and Israel at that time was scattered all over the world. I'd like to just, before we get into the, the chapter here, just uh, what you said in the set of it. These were Jews. They were Jewish servants of yes. a man they believed to be the Jewish king who would set up the Jewish throne. He was going to sit on the throne of his father, David. And, uh, and just to, to let you know what kind of mood Jesus the man was, remember he's 100% God and he's 100% man. Yes. He never quit being God and he never quit being a man. So right before they're in the temple and they ask him about the temple, and, uh, and, uh, and he tells them there won't be one stone left on another. Right before that, in verse 37 of chapter 23, Jerusalem and, and it, the nation of Israel has formally rejected Jesus as their king. And because they will not follow him, they will not believe him. And then he's got the 12 here, and of course one of them is a devil. And uh, they, he tells Jerusalem in, in verse 37 to 23, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. Yeah. 
How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth their chickens under her wings, and you would not? Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then he walks out of the temple. And while they're standing on the outside of the temple, the, the disciples like pointing at everything and Jesus says you won't see one stone left upon another what he says here is something that you hear in temple if you ever go with a friend to the synagogue to their to a Jewish Sabbat you will hear this every uh, you'll hear this every Saturday morning and it goes like this Barak Habab Hashim Adonai and it means blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord they're still looking for him they are They'll see him soon enough <laughs> yeah. because he's coming. So this is the kind, Jesus, the, the, the nation of Israel has just rejected Jesus as their king when he walks out of the temple. And he says, you ain't going to see me again until you're glad to see me, is essentially right. what he says. Je Jesus is basically saying to these, these disciples here uh, and the scribes and the Pharisees, you want signs? The church is going to receive the sign of death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to die on the cross. And he's going to remove the veil of the temple. He's going to remove the, the, the lambs and the offerings. He said, but he says to the Jewish people, you want signs? I'm going to run them out your nose. <laughs> so the signs in chapter 24 is signs running out the Jewish people's nose. For Israel. Israel, yes. And so we need to understand that they want signs. They're going to have them. And they're not the kind of signs they're going to want. But um, I think it's important that we understand that chapter 24 is not a Gentile chapter. It's a Jewish chapter. It is not a church chapter. In fact, it's not really a book of Revelation chapter, although you find things about Revelation in it. The chapter 24 is about Jesus coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to rule as the Messiah in Israel. And he went away, and during this time he calls the church unto himself, and one day he'll return after he catches the church on. And he will come back after they have signs running out their nose. Signs like hailstones, the size of 150 pounds apiece. Signs like locusts crawling on the ground. Signs like earthquakes in divers places and famine. And the white horse riding out, which is the Antichrist making a covenant with Israel for one week, seven years in Daniel chapter 7. Signs like after the white horse rides out in Revelation chapter 6, like the red horse riding out afterwards, blood, war breaking out everywhere. Signs like the, um, the um, black, horse. black horse, famine, disease, pestilence, the pale horse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I don't know why they call it the four horsemen, but anyway, uh, it is called the four horsemen. Actually, there's five because death follows it. And there's another one riding a horse as death. It doesn't give too much about it, but there's actually five of them. But anyway, um, that's in Revelation. And so we want to talk about, I guess we want to do some myth busting, huh? Yeah, and I just want to add one more thing about Jesus leaving. They've rejected, Israel has rejected him. Jesus has rejected them. I'm not coming back until you're glad to see me. You know, until you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The disciples asking these questions, and it's kind of a setup. You could take verses three, uh, verses 4 through 14 when Jesus starts describing things that are going to happen in the great tribulation. These are not signs for the rapture, as James pointed out. The church will not live through these particular signs. But if we can see those signs and hear the noise, well, then we're close to it. You know, if you see all the Christmas decorations coming out, you know it's close to Thanksgiving. Right. 
We're close to Thanksgiving. <laughs> and that's the kind of signs we get for the rapture. Bad news is coming to the turkey. <laughs> it's right. That's right. The turkey, is, the turkey does not enjoy Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, but verses, verses 4 through 14, essentially, uh, God, uh, Jesus is almost telling his disciples, his Jewish disciples, that, okay, because the nation has rejected me, they could have had the kingdom. But because they rejected me, they're going to get this before they get the kingdom. Right. And, 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 and these are specific things for Israel. The church will not be upon the earth. We will be with the Lord at that point. But like we keep saying, if we can see some of these uh, shadows of these things starting to happen, close. then how close are we to it? We're getting close. Of course, the, the catching of the church could have took place in Paul's day. Yes. But now that we're seeing all the signs, like the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's like that. How I many would agree that this was like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, amen. And pride, having the pride marches and all that. Trust me, that's not something I would be proud of. But nonetheless, you know, we need to understand that uh, evil increases. And in the days of Noah, it was vile, it was wicked. I don't think the days of Noah was primitive. I believe it was high tech. Amen. I believe before the days of Noah, I think it was as high tech as it is today. I'm serious. And giants were in the land. We talked about this the other day in prayer, in prep. That's a good, we ought to, we ought to have a class called prayer and prep. Yeah. Okay. But I think that, that uh, the, the, the society before the flood was a whole lot more advanced than yes, we ever really consider. Because you look at so many of the unexplainable things on the earth, where'd they come from? The <laughs> you know? There's so many things. It's incredible. And when you think about the days of Noah, you know, the sign that Jesus gave wasn't the signs that in, in Genesis 5 and 6 that it gives. The signs that Jesus gives is they're eating and drinking, giving in marriage, or building. And have you ever seen a time where they're building like they are today? And they're partying and giving in marriage and they're eating and they're, their hearts, uh, what's it called? Uh, surfeiting? Is that the word? It, it surfeiting is? means that you're sinning so much that you're trying to find new ways to sin. Yeah, yeah, and it means the buffet's really good too. Yeah, surfing. It's Easy like it's like sin surfing, like channel surfing. You're looking for new ways to commit uh, evil. So when you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, and you look at Noah, just before the flood, there was a man that was raptured. He was translated. His name was Enoch. He walked with God. He was not. Because God took him. It's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 and also in Genesis just before the flood. It was Noah's great, Noah's great granddaddy. Yeah, yeah. And the book of Jude says that Enoch was a preacher of righteousness and he preached it was ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. Boy, he was really hammering it. Everything's ungodly just before he was raptured. He, but he said this before he was caught away. He said before he was evacuated, he said... The Lord cometh with ten, ten thousands, thousands of his saints. That's in the book of Jude. And so if I'm correct, and I believe I am, that Enoch is a picture of the church being taken before the great wrath of God is poured out like the days of Noah. I agree with James completely. And I, I got to give old brother Enoch credit because he not only describes the second coming of Jesus Christ before the first coming, yeah. he describes the second coming of Jesus Christ before the flood. True. <laughs> and I think he was confused a little bit. I think he had no, Adam a little bit confused with that too, you know, Methuselah, but anyway. Uh, but anyway, um, I do believe that Enoch was translated, the Bible says they looked for him, you know, Russia has com cosmonauts, America has astronauts, God has was-nots. Enoch was not. <laughs> He's caught up into the clouds. He's caught before the Lord. Where do you come He's up with all this? Where huh? do you get all this? I've well, never hey, heard that before. <laughs> let me put it like this. Enoch is never going to die. So, well, he has to. 
Hebrews 9, 27. He answered, no, he doesn't. If the Lord comes tonight, I'm not dying. There's going to be millions of people not dying. It's appointed unto men once to die, the race of men. It's appointed unto the race of men to die. But there are exceptions. And the church is an exception. Knock's going to be caught up. To, and he was translated up. Same word that they used for us being translated up. And there's something that we didn't discuss, but you could add to that. During the millennial kingdom, when Christ comes again, he sets up the kingdom on the earth. And we're restored pretty much like it was in the garden where the lamb lays down with the lion and all that stuff's going to last a thousand years. It's a time where, uh, where they said that, that if, a, if a person died at a hundred years old, they'd say it was just a child. And so there will be mortal people in that kingdom. And so the people who are alive in that kingdom and, and are flesh and blood mortal people, uh, when, 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 when the final judgment comes and the new heaven and new earth come, those people will be, will be given their glorified bodies just like we be, will be at the rapture. So there'll be another set of people who will be in eternity in the new heaven and the new earth without having to die. Yeah, yeah. And you look at Noah, when he was in the ark, he was lifted above the wrath of God. By the flood waters, he was lifted above. And so there'll be people preserved in the great tribulation but it won't be the church, it'll be tribulation saints, and right. it'll be uh, Jewish believers that will trust Jesus as Savior. They'll be lifted above the waters, preserved, but the church is going home like you know. I've heard it put by our, uh, our Messianic Jewish friend, Amir. Uh, he said that Enoch is a picture of the rapture of the church. And he, he said because, because the church is delivered out of the world, out of the troubles, sure. but... Noah and the ark is a picture of Israel during the tribulation because they're preserved through the troubles. One third of them are preserved. Well, there's two thirds these, that will die. These surviving. Zachariah. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to be preserved if you're dead. But I meant the <laughs> unless you're Moses, the ones that make it. Yeah, unless you're Moses. You haven't brought that up yet. Well, I know. When we uh, get there, when we get so, there. Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Let's look at that for a minute. What did the angel say to Lot and his wife and their, his daughters? What did the angel say before the fire and brimstone fell on the city to destroy it? What did the angel say? Get out of the city because we can do nothing until you're out. Rapture. And Peter refers to Lot and he says, the Lord knows how to preserve those that are his. Yeah, and we've got some lots in our church, too. Lots of them? Well, I wonder if they're going to make it, but they will. Oh, I thought maybe you have lots of lots. Lots of lots. <laughs> you know, if, if, if there was anyone in the Bible that I would think didn't make it, it would have been Lot, but it says right there in Peter that he was a righteous man. So, you know, I look at folks in our church over the years, and I'm thinking, we got lots around they're, they're going to make it. I don't know how, but they're going to make it. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? You know, you it, it, it doesn't say it in, in the, the Genesis account, but since James brought it up, uh, I finally found out what the, what the last words that Mrs. Lot heard was on earth. Well, the last thing she heard was, hey, baby, is anybody following us? Repeat that. Hey, baby, is anybody following us? <laughs> and she turns around and looks, and that's the end of it right there. And hey, baby, got pretty salty, didn't he, she? He maybe should have thought that through. <laughs> oh, man. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. What are we going to do with you? <laughs> well, I wasn't there. I don't have a video. <laughs> Matthew chapter 24 is just that. It's signs to Israel. He's telling his, his disciples, I'm coming back, but not like you think. Thank you. And, and you know, he's coming great. back to Israel. And he's going to set up his king, his kingdom. He, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But first, he's going to take a group of people home. 
that the kingdom of God is within them, the church of Jesus Christ. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be with Jesus Christ. And then he's coming back to set up a kingdom. In Revelation chapter 19, he comes, King of kings and Lord of lords. Upon his head was many crowns. And we're coming with him in Revelation chapter 19. James, let me compare, just real quick, let me compare something to that. Acts chapter 1. Uh, because the disciples at the beginning of first uh, of, of, of chapter 24 of Matthew, they're saying, you know, what will be the signs of your coming? Uh, because they want to know when the kingdom is going to be set up. And then, the very, you know, on the day that he is, ascends into heaven, uh, this is 40 days after the resurrection. He's there on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And they say in verse 6, when they therefore were come together, chapter 1 of Acts, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> they're asking him, they're yes. asking him before the crucifixion, are you going to restore it now? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, Jesus is resurrected and 40 days later, just, are you going to restore it now? They're still asking the same question because that they, they, they believe that he is their king and he is their king but they still have not because they didn't have the Holy Ghost living inside them yet to interpret the scripture Pentecost is still 10 days off and, and I think that they just didn't get what Jesus said that, that there was a ruler that was going to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and he leaves his servants and they didn't get that far but they're still asking is the kingdom now is the kingdom now and Jesus tells Tells them in verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And what he's saying here is, is they're still asking him, when are you going to, you know, when are you going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus says, I tell you what, you let me worry about the kingdom and you be my witness. Yeah. And Daniel chapter, <laughs> Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 says the Messiah would be cut off. And when he was cut off, God began to call him out of church. And then when God turns back to Israel, the church will be gone. And the seventh week begins, which is seven years, which is the book of Revelation, a covenant. And that seven years begins with the covenant of the Antichrist, the white horse riding down in Revelation chapter 6. And it's a covenant that declares and confirms the security of Israel it does. as a it nation. Does. And so, you know, there's a lot of covenants trying to be made now. We're seeing a lot happen. I mean, we're seeing Israel is just, I mean, we're seeing biblical things going on over there. And we're, and, and we're getting so close. The sign to us, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the signs are starting to run out of their noses in Israel. God is showing them so many things. And Jerusalem, Israel has become a burdensome to the nations. And to the point, eventually, it will be hated of all nations. I don't know what's going to happen to America. It may disintegrate. Don't get better leadership. I know it will. And, you know, God does uh, they don't have to sin. North Korea or Iran doesn't have to sin, or Russia doesn't, have, or China doesn't have to send a, a nuclear bomb to destroy America. All they have to do is stop our economy, just let it fall apart. We're no good. And, and Shoot, our folks can't get through without hairspray or brush, toothbrush, or, or you know they they forecast a snow coming and the Murphins at grocery stores are invaded. Well, I'm just trying to get over Waterburger coming, you know. I mean, that was a big plus. Yeah, yeah, that was. That's a sign of. It's a sign. It's a sign of something. <laughs> but that was a sign of his coming. But I, I, I tell you, I, <laughs> that that little bit of levity, uh, I, I wanted to throw that out there first because I, James is talking about. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen to the United States, but I fear and I see, and you know. We we got it. We're kind of divided in the in the church world. Yeah. You know, we got we got one group of people over here that don't want to pay any attention to the world, and so they don't know what's going on. Right. Well, I'm on the other side. 
I really don't. I really don't listen to what people, what talking heads say on the news. I, most of the time, I'm just watching with the sound off because I want to see what's going on, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I'll know because I can figure it out for myself. I don't need somebody to tell me what I'm seeing. I can see it, you know. The, the world and, has heard enough but, about Israel. The world has heard enough about Israel. The world's starting to get concerned. Yes, and my point is that I'm afraid. And I see it incrementally already after, after just a few days over a month. Uh, I, I see that this government of the United States starting to retract and withdraw from their commitment to Israel. Happen. I see it a little more every day. You know, the Jewish hatred. Exactly. Jewish hatred is just going to begin to fester and continue to fester. Wars and rumors of war beginning to sorrow. Is there any other people on earth... That, that, that people just want to kill them because they're, because they're that way. You know, I mean, I've never heard of anything except the Jews. All throughout, all throughout biblical history, somebody is trying to destroy the Jews. You know, Pharaoh tried to destroy the Jews. Haman tried to destroy the Jews. Someone's always trying to destroy the Jews. Hitler wasn't the first. You know, you had all through the Middle Ages, you had all these European countries. They would have what they called pogroms, and they ran the Jews out. You ever see that movie, Fiddler on the Roof? It was about, you know, Rev Tevye and his, and his three daughters that he was trying to marry off, you know. And, and, and they were in Kiev, in Ukraine. And the Jew haters there were running them out. It, it, it is an old problem in Europe, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, it is not going away. It's still there. Uh, you know, everybody hates the Jews, and you know in why? In every nation. In every nation. The reason people hate the Jews is because Satan hates the Jews. Why does he hate the Jews? Because God loves the Jews. They are his people. They haven't quit being his people. They're going to keep being his people. He will come, and he is a Jew. He, like I've told you before, he didn't turn into a Gentile in heaven. He will sit on the throne of David. That's right. And it doesn't mean the Jews are perfect. I mean, Jesus, no, no. Jesus awfully really... I mean, obviously, Jesus got put out with them. We got to get saved the same way we got to get saved. That's right, they do. But they are God's people. And, and he, they he, are a sign. And God keeps his promises. And the signs going to Israel is to tell us, heads up, you know, there's no sign to the rapture. But when we see these signs getting close, folks, we need to get, the, we need to get our act together. But the Lord could have came 100 years ago, but I, I don't think we got 100 years no. left. I don't think we got 50 years left. No. I'd be surprised we got just a couple of decades left. I'd be surprised we got another two or three weeks left, honestly. I don't know if we'll be here next Sunday. <laughs> yeah. And I think maybe the Lord's running late a little bit in that area. That, <laughs> the, the Lord's coming. Amen. But all these signs, Pastor, you keep talking about, the, the, the first one's deception. It is. Let's yeah. read this. Let's read this, Jimmy. Verse 4, And Jesus answered, this is Matthew 24, and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my namesake, what we've been talking about. And when they, and they shall be, many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Hallelujah. When you therefore see the abomination and desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place at 
Whosoever readeth, let him understand. That's in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Before Jimmy comments on this deception, I want to say where it talks about wars and rumors of war, the end's not yet. Did you know since 3600 B.C., since 3600 B.C., there has been more than 14,000 recorded wars. And we're seeing those wars escalate. And we're seeing the hatred escalate. Hello. And Jesus described it like birth pains. Like a woman going into labor. Waves and waves of labor. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing Israel beginning its first signs of labor. And all of these things that James read, you could make a case and say, well, we've always had this stuff. We've always had famines, always had pestilences, always had wars, always yeah. had all this stuff. But, you know, I, I am a fair armchair student of history, and I can't, I don't know of a time when we've had them all at the same time are this intense. There is a a convergence of events. There is an intensification of all these things. Uh, just quickly, I, uh, you know, talks about pestilences and famines, and uh, and 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 these are you know great you know starvation episodes. Uh, I was reading a paper that the United Nations put out. Uh, whoever was in charge of Africa and the food supply in Africa, and they said that it's possible that uh, as many as one-fourth of the population of, of Africa could die if we don't do something within the next 12 to 18 months because Russia and Ukraine are at war. Between Russia and Ukraine, they produce nearly 40% of the world's wheat supply. Without wheat, you don't have bread. Between Russia and Ukraine, they produce over 50% of the world's nitrogen fertilizer supply. What farmer in the United States is farming without fertilizer? None. You can't. You know, you can see if a fourth of the people on the continent of Africa are going to starve, what's going on in other South Asian and, and East Asian and countries, South America too. Yeah, and you'll see an escalation in this when the black horse rides out. Yes. When the pale horse rides out in Revelation chapter 6, you're going to see an escalation. Disease. There. Yeah, disease. Uh, folks, they're, they're making chocolate chip cookies out of crickets. Did you know that? Yeah. Did you know that they're trying that. to do away with the meat supply and we're going to start eating bugs? Not me. Just like I'll, John the I'll Baptist. Have a cracker. I'll have a cracker box the other day, and it was full of bugs. I throw it in the trash. I, I would, didn't eat too. the crackers. But you got people out there thinking, mmm, food. Not me. We're going to grind up a bunch of crickets. You better watch it. Read your labels before you get that package of cookies. It may be not chocolate chips. It may be black crickets. Well, I suppose I could do anything that the Lord uh, imposed upon me to do, but I'm afraid if it came down to like John the Baptist eating locust and wild honey, I figured I'd have to just let them hop on by. I, I'm just well, not I'm an open flame. I'm sure. Of barbecue myself. <laughs> but anyway, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, deceive many. There's always been deception, and when he says there'll be many come in my name saying I am Christ. That can work two ways. Someone can say, well, I'm Jesus. Look at me. And that's, there's been thousands of people do that. But it can also go the other way where people are saying Jesus is Christ, but they're preaching the wrong Christ. Not a lot the, of people, people preaching yeah, the wrong Christ. Not the Christ of the at? Bible, but a God that they, like I say, created in their own image, in their that's own true. creation. I call him Hollywood Jesus. You all know, right. All right. see them on Jimmy, TV. But there'll be many come. Wars and rumors of wars, check. False Christ, check. Saying I'm Christ, but deceiving many, check. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places, check, check. 
All these are the beginning of sorrows. Luke okay. is instructive. Uh, I, uh, when I came out of my, when I came out of the the brain surgery, and I was in ICU, Rick said that I said this, and we looked it up afterward because uh, I don't remember it. But he said when I when I when I open my eyes and I see you that I quoted this verse is 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 revel it's a Saint Luke Gospel of Luke chapter twenty one verse thirty four and it 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 talks about this stuff here it says and take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life and so that day come upon you unawares you know we're have we're having so many. Uh, we're so many hints about the things that are going to happen and the trends that we're seeing. You know, we shouldn't be taken by surprise about anything. It's like, you know, last year when, uh, or year before last, when I saw uh, Iran, uh, uh, Afghanistan, and I saw the way we left Afghanistan, I'm sitting there watching it on TV, and I never believed that I would see a thing like that, but I saw it. Yeah. yeah. It happened. And, and the weapons they left behind, these guys in Hamas are using against Israel right now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you, have you ever heard someone say in verse 14 of Matthew 24 that the gospel's got to be preached to the world before Jesus can come? You ever heard someone say that? Yeah. It's based on verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So they say the end can't come because we ain't preached Jesus to the whole world. That's not what that verse is saying. That verse is saying despite everything, despite the great tribulation, despite the persecution, despite all that's going to come upon the world, God will always have his word declared. That's right. His word's been preached to all nations already, but look at the, the YouTube and look at the Facebook and the live streaming, but that's not got anything to do with it. I mean, a man can ride a camel with, on a cell phone or something there, right? right? But nonetheless, he's not saying that the gospel's got to be preached to everyone before Jesus can return, and they want, like, right. they want to hook that to the rapture. It's not rapture. That's the end. The, the key end comes. The key phrase is for a witness. Yeah. The witness is there. And, and Paul uses that in Romans where he said, where, in Acts, where he said, but God left not himself without witness. God Wait, always leaves a witness. You also remember the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel to mm -hmm. every creature. And then he told them to go and preach to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world, right? Right. Now, what he said on the day of Pentecost? Go out there and preach to all nations. Wait and carry and preach to all nations. Now, stop and think. What was the end of the world? Rome. Rome was the end of the world. They preached to Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to Rome. And I would submit the disciples achieved that in their lifetime. Yeah. But I don't think that's what it's talking about. I do believe what he's saying is that God will never be without a people. Right. And the word will always be there, and people will always have a chance to be saved if they want to be. Yeah. Another time like that I think of, James, is, is if you think about it during the great missionary movement that, for about, that came out of the Great Awakening uh, in the, 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 the 18th century from like 1750 to 1925, uh, you know, preachers with nothing but a King James Bible and a shotgun and a piano playing wife took the gospel to the entire world during that 175 years. I mean, and there are all kinds of reasons why it fell apart. You know, you can almost date it to the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925. The belief in evolution, the belief in man's own ability to save himself from his problems. When I was a little kid, it was all those scientists in white coats in the science fiction movies. They had the answers to everything, you know. And so that's why it fell apart. The electric light is probably the greatest invention of Satan the devil. 
because the electric light makes us think we're safe in any situation, makes us think we're secure if the light is on, but the darkness is right there. But you gotta stop and, and stop and think about this too. If you preach to all nations, you preach to the whole world, time moves on. What are you gonna do for the next three generations? They gotta hear the word. So God is saying that he'll never be without a people. Right. Revelation chapter 11, two witnesses. Yes. Revelation chapter 7, 144,000 Jews. Yes. Holy Ghost filled, powerful Billy Grahams yes. that are Jews yes. from every tribe. And then if that isn't enough in Revelation chapter 14 verse 6, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Sing with a loud voice. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. Worship God. Well, I'm getting excited. I'm about to kick this table up. And give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This is an angel talking to people down on the earth up, giving them a chance. and they're looking up there what yeah. in the world is going on you know, I, you know it takes a really thick skull to not listen to yeah that. but what they're going to say is i think i'll have another brat turn the game back on <laughs> yeah so you know when you hear people say well the gospel's got to be preached to all nations for the end time he's just simply saying the gospel will be preached to everyone up to the end and I think the gospel has been preached to many nations and to the whole world several generations. So God is just simply saying the end will not come without God giving everybody a chance to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? And then you've got other people that will say, well, you know, the Lord can't come until, you know, uh, we see the abomination in the temple. You know, the temple's got to be built. The Lord can't mm -hmm. come. Listen, the Lord may come before the temple's built for the church. He may come after the temple's built. You say, what are you going to do, preacher, if they build a temple next month or next year? I'm going to rejoice. I'll getting, watch. I'm just getting closer. <laughs> we're, just, we're just getting closer, aren't we? We'll, we'll, get, no up, signs. we'll get up a field trip. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, he, you know, and, and also bear this in mind. It's something that a lot of people haven't considered, but I, I've spent some time thinking about it. I think about the way they worshipped before they built Solomon's temple. And we have instances they went to the tabernacle when it was at Shiloh. They went to the tabernacle uh, when, when David brought the ark to Jerusalem. Uh, they, they had a transition time. And so what I'm thinking of is this. If they decide to rebuild the temple... And they, they, they can reinstitute the holy sacrifice by purifying the, the site, by building the altar, by setting up the brazen altar. That's the budding of the fig tree. And, 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 and they could start having sacrifices the before the, the roof the is even over their head. Why couldn't they put up a pop-up tent? They could, have, they could start the daily sacrifice without having the temple finished. Have you ever thought about that? And that is the budding of the fig tree. The budding of the fig the tree. The budding of the fig tree. Because Israel's tree is olive tree. But the ministry, the, the priest, religious the Levites, service. That is, what did Jesus curse? The fig tree the fig didn't tree. have fruit. What did he curse? He cursed the fig tree. It resulted in the veil of the temple being rent, Jerusalem being toppled, the high priest and everybody being removed because he cursed that system and, of sacrifice. And he never, cur he never cursed an olive tree. As a matter of fact, the two witnesses, James witness and uh, James mentioned in chapter 11, they're mentioned in chapter 6 of... Uh, of, uh, of Zechariah too, that there there his two olive trees, yeah. the, the two witnesses in Jerusalem, and so he's uh, you know these are two different metaphors that that people get confused sometimes. And what did God use to burn the temple down? Olive trees. Olive trees. Sure did. It, it was a purification. He didn't days. use he didn't use fig trees to burn it down, yeah. or date olive palms. Tree. And Nebuchadnezzar cut down all the date palms. <laughs> That's another lesson. And then there's another one in here in uh, Revelation 
or in uh, Matthew 24, verse 13, but he that endures unto the end shall be saved. That is a statement of the stability and the strength of those that are trusting Christ. You don't have to do that to be saved. You do that because you are saved. You're preserved by the power of God. He that endures to the end shall be saved. That's not a doctrine of works. That is God preserving you during a time of great upheaving. Anytime you get outside the book and start doing works, then you're in trouble. That's right. It, it's finished by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There was a man whose name I won't mention. He was a brother that was respected by many, but I thought he bordered heresy. But uh, he's dead now, and so God bless him. Uh, but, well, he really got it, didn't he? <laughs> well, he may be with the Lord, because I think you can be wrong and still be with the Lord, of course. But what he said was these tribulation saints that they wouldn't get saved the same way that we do. They'd have to be sacrificing and earning their way to heaven. That ain't true. And that's not what the scripture says. Oh, I know who that guy is. Yeah, I know you do. Yeah, but I, he's dead. I, he is dead, yeah. yes. But, uh, yeah, I know who that guy is. He he's was dead. a classmate of old Clyde Childs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he had a big radio broadcast. Yeah, but he, he was a big prominent guy in the he independent was. Baptist movement. Oh, yeah, I know. And, but he's uh, dead. But he's dead, yes. Oh, he's dead. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he is. Well, and his message is dead. I'm not glad he's dead. I think dead, the message, message is dead, dead, too. Because, But, you know, in, in no circumstance did you ever have to work to get your salvation. The people who were saved under the old covenant were saved because of their faith. Hebrews chapter 11 makes that specifically clear. True. Yeah. True. Okay, we got to have questions and answers because we're oh, running out of time. Can I give one more? Do one more. Do it quick. There was one that we, we give, glazed give me over. A it it says quick. that in verse 11, it says, I mean, verse 10, it says that, uh, that uh, many shall be offended. Is there anybody today in this culture who ain't offended by something? Many, that shows you how close it is. Many <laughs> yeah, shall be offended, yeah. shall that betray one another, shall hate one another. Oh, that's Pentecostal. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We, you know, we don't hate each other. We we're just, gonna get dislikes on the Facebook. We don't want you to dislike us because we're afraid we'll be reported to some higher ups someplace. Well, you don't have any higher ups here except the Lord, do you? Right. We don't. <laughs> we don't have no hierarchy. And it says now we don't have no hierarchy at all around here. Any archy? <laughs> The Lord no told Noah all. to build him an archie, archie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> verse 11. This is, this is something that, uh, no, verse 12. This is something we glassed over, but th I think this is at the root of everything because it's how people act and how people feel. It says that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And you think about, well, how come people are so mean? How come people are so unloving? How come people don't care? It's because the sin is so big. Josh is going to open up for questions, but I want to say this real quick because I really want to open this can of glory worms. <laughs> There's people who believe and teach that there has to come a great revival before the rapture of the church. Ooh. Not so. Not so. There's been revivals all along. There's been massive revivals. Catherine Kuhlman. Um, other great preachers, Oral Roberts, despite what you think of him, that was a great time of revival. Branham, a great time of revival. 1800s, the Pentecostal movement, the Word of Faith movement, and, uh, the Jesus movement in 1978. There has been great revivals. There's great revival going on in other places right now just because you don't see it in your corner. It doesn't mean... But there are people that that teach that there has to be a great revival before the rapture. That is not true. And they're specific, James, about it being a, a, a universal revival. Yeah, they want it to be you know, bring, bring Jesus back through our revival. That's not true. In fact, the greatest revival the world will ever see will be during the Great Tribulation. Amen. After the church is removed. Amen. After we're gone. So why is there going to be a great revival after the church is removed? Because we ain't done our job. I want to speak unkind about the church, but we haven't done our job. And we're going to be taken out of here. And then the two witnesses and the 144,000 and the Jews will get the job done. Yes. And there'll be a great revival during the Great Tribulation. Right. But don't let anybody tell you, well, there's got to be this great revival. There's got to be this 
arms growing back and lame jumping for, and eyes opening up and there's a massive move of God on the earth. Jesus can't come and tell. We see that. Well, who says? Because that, would give, that would give us a false security, James. Says, well, Jesus, Jesus is not going to come today because we haven't had the big revival yet, so i got time to play it on the back nine. And there are preachers that will tell you he can't come. Unless there's a revival, he can't come. And that, my friend, tells me that the preacher who says that is not looking for Jesus. Right. And so we need to understand that we are commanded to look for Jesus. We, we are commanded to look to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. That's right. We're looking for <laughs> Jesus. And if a revival comes before the rapture, whoopee! Awesome! But it doesn't have to. Amen? We'll be playing in it. <laughs> it isn't right for us to say, God, Jesus cannot come without at first a great revival. What should be say, stated is this. Jesus can come before a great revival. He can come after a great revival. But we're not going to put restrictions on the fact that he can return any moment. Anytime. You better get some questions. We're going to wrap this up. Raise your hand if you have a question. I know you got questions. We, we brought up a bunch of stuff. We dig this up on Thursday and then shovel it out on Sunday night. <laughs> when the church is evacuated, yeah. the light and the salt of the earth has now been removed. That's We're going to have this beautiful wedding and the marriage. Will the Holy Spirit be at this wedding? Yes. Are we going to be in the Holy Spirit or will the Holy Spirit remain here? Me and Jimmy don't agree on this, but I'm right. <laughs> it's not that we don't agree. We just have a little bit of different angle okay. on it. I don't believe the Holy Spirit's going to be, be removed at the rapture. I believe he that now let it will let until he be taken away. I think that he is the church. And when the church is taken out of the way, then he, that wicked, will be revealed. He is not, and you say, well, the church is a she. Not when it's concerning the body of Christ and not when it's concerning the army. So I do believe that at the rapture, the church will be removed, but the Holy Ghost will not be. We're closer than, than James suspects. It's called a he. The church is called a he, referring to the body of Christ, because we are his body. We're called she when we're referred to as the bride of Christ. I believe the Holy Ghost will still be here because he is God. One of the natures of God is omnipresence. That means he's everywhere at the same time. It's true. And so you can't just jerk the church out and not have God, the Holy Ghost, still here on the earth. He, he didn't come at Pentecost. He did come at Pentecost for a new ministry. But he didn't come at Pentecost. You open your Bible. He is in the second verse of Genesis chapter 1. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are all there. And, and so uh, he didn't just pop up later. The Spirit of God is moving upon the waters in verse 2 in the beginning. Yeah. And, at, and at the baptism, at the of, baptism Jesus, of, Je of the, Jesus, the Spirit of God descended like a dove and abode on Jesus. And that word abode means for a time, a purpose, a ministry. And then the, yeah. other, the other deal is in the upper room when, 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 when uh, Jesus says that, it says that the Comforter's going to come. He's going to live inside you. He's going to. He says, and we're my father and I. We're going to come and live with you. We'll make our home with you. So not only are you going to have God the Holy Ghost inside of you, you're going to have God the Father and God the Son coming and sitting at your table with you. That's right. And so to answer your question, in plain vanilla, Jesus Christ, when He takes the church home, caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, the church will be removed. That is the he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit will remain here. We'll be with Jesus Christ. Because he's God. Because he's God. And the wedding will be in heaven Amen. with Jesus during the great tribulation period. We'll be safe in the arms of our Savior. The wedding will be then. But the marriage supper of the Lamb will be on the earth after the great tribulation. Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the patriarchs have to get their bodies so they can sit at the table Amen. and partake of that meal. Right. Yes, uh, when you look at Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the abomination and desecration. Yeah. We, we know that's in the middle of the tribulation, if I'm correct on that, uh, when the Antichrist will go into the temple 
And yeah, because he says, what, 1,230 days, right? And he will break, yep. he will break the covenant. How far earlier in Matthew, before Jesus mentions that, a corresponds with Revelation 6, with the first Antichrist writer, does, does the earlier portion of, of Matthew 24 correspond with the, the famines, the, the writers, and uh, the, the, seal the wars of, of the seals? Do you think that corresponds with that, or is he talking about an earlier time? Well, I have a thought of a couple of thoughts. I think that, uh, first let me say, I believe that, uh, that uh, uh, taking away the daily sacrifice in Daniel, and, and I believe that corresponds at the time in the tribulation with chapter 11, where the two witnesses are killed and taken up. And uh, I kinda, I believe that uh, it's gonna happen sometime almost directly in chapter 13 after the false prophet causes the whole world to worship the image of the beast. Uh, because he sets, uh, uh, he's gonna set up his image in the temple and, and, and proclaim that he is God and demand to be worshiped as God. So I think that all of those are pretty, uh, come pretty close around the midpoint. Do they happen on the same day? I don't know, we don't have enough information. James? The abomination of desolation will take place in the middle of the Great Tribulation. The children of Israel will flee to probably Petra and Jordan. There will be two-thirds of the Jewish people destroyed. One-third will be preserved in that place. That's when Jesus will return at the end of the Great Tribulation. And it says in verse 29 of chapter 24 of Matthew, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then, and only then, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man coming in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven in the power of great glory. You remember Jesus Christ said to them, if, if they say that Christ is here, don't go there. If they say Christ is in the desert, don't go there. If Christ says he's here, don't go there. Because he said, you'll know when I come. As lightning cometh from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That is not the rapture, that's the return of Jesus to Israel. And you're right, in the middle of the great tribulation, there'll be this antichrist rise up and do an abomination. I think it will be an AI type. Um, um, the image? Um, an image. Yeah, that's what I, I think, too. Wherein uh, Antiochus, when he did it, he put up a statue of Zeus in the temple. But in the Great Tribulation, I think it'll be a, because the image speaks. I think it'll be a robot of some type, an android of some type. Yeah. Which brings up the idea that, that we're building the system that the Antichrist will use right now because until now and with, you know, without, the, uh, without the advent of AI and modern technology, digital technology, computing power, he wouldn't have the ability to track all the buying and selling and, on the face the of the earth. The beast, the mark of the beast will work or not work, will work or not work, has nothing to do with your credit card, your debit card. It will have everything to do with his control over what you buy and sell. And it'll be connected into digital. Well, they'll know everything you buy, everything you do. And that is part of the mark of the beast. So, you know, we're getting into some areas, but yeah. anybody else question? But we're heading that way now. The technology is getting in place. Yes. I have a question where it says that when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise and the bride goes up, it also says in Revelation 8 that when that happens, that there's 30 minutes of silence. Do you have any additional insight on that particular verse? Because I don't seem to see that mention of silence in heaven anywhere else. I preached to, I preached to the book of Revelation, and I, while I was showing the character of God, he always wanted people to be saved. And if you'll read that, I don't remember the exact chapter, but if you read that, Jesus, God goes into his temple and there's silence for 30 minutes. And that silence, I believe God is sobbing in his temple because he's losing everyone he loves. 
And I believe that silence is not just silence per se in the heaven. I believe God goes into his temple and he breaks down. I'd have to go to the chapter and pull it up where I preached it in the past. I may remember that, where God actually just goes into silence. And he's just broken. Because the next judgment is going to literally annihilate the planet. And he don't let the angels do what they're going to do until he deals. Does that answer your question somewhat? And I don't remember another 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 mention of it but i think that I, I i feel like james does i think that that there's a pause there because of the import you know all the way through these uh, we're getting into the trumpet judgments but even in the seal judgments it said and still men would not repent yeah it's so hideous and, and, that god and is just broken. They, they still would not repent i know god can't have a nervous breakdown but i think if he ever could it was then and that I think time he's where he went into silence and, and he didn't come out till later. His voice says, Okay, angels, do your work. And I think it shows the long suffering of God because even though men are, would rather have the rocks fall on them than to obey God and they're hiding in caves and everything. That'd be a good study in Revelation, wouldn't it? Exactly. Oh yeah. But I believe even though even though that, that no one so far has stepped forward of these people who will not accept him, he's still given them thirty minutes. To go, okay. Yeah, and, and here's God your here's your last it. chance. Go ahead and speak God didn't up. Didn't want to do it. He did not mm -hmm. want to do it. This is. I think it pictures his long suffering and patience. You go into Revelation and find that where silence, and read the chapter four and chapter after, and you'll see what I'm talking about. God goes into His holy temple. There's silence, and a voice comes out of the temple, telling the angels, "Now you can do it." It, it was just a time in which God was just saying. I, I'm having a hard time with this. I really am. Anybody else? Question? Oh, come on. We're about out of time. But Jimmy, we probably ought to mention uh, in the time of Maccabean area where the, the uh, desolation took place. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, remember Antiochus Epiphanes or yeah, Antiochus Epiphanes Antiochus from the from the uh, empire of Seleucus which was actually a general off of um, Alexander the Great and when he died he divided it up into four, into four generals, kingdoms one of them was the Seleucus Empire and out of the Seleucus Empire the eighth king and his name was Antiochus and he came down he, and he, just, he, 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 he killed an animal. He desecrated the temple. He destroyed it. He killed several thousand Jews. And he, and he took swine. Yeah, swine. And he poured swine juices and, and feces all over the temple. On the altar. Totally did it. And Jesus Christ said, well, basically Jesus is saying that's not the one, but it's a forerunner of it. It was actually... Uh, 168 BC was uh, Seleucus, Syria. He was divided into Syria, same as uh, uh, Asia Minor, Seleucus. And so there's a, how many ever heard of the Maccabees? Yeah. Yeah. And so Judas Maccabees comes and says, enough is enough. And he stormed the temple. He took it back. They re healed, re cleansed, re repaired the temple. And rededicated it. Amen. Yeah, and rededicated it. And that was before the coming of Jesus. So yes. we know that there's coming a man of sin that's going to do basically the same thing, only in a greater measure. And Jews all over the world are fixing to celebrate the, the memorial of that. Remember, the, remember that, that passage in John where it says that it was the feast of the dedication and it was winter? Yeah. Well, the Feast of the Dedication was the rededication of the temple after, after Antiochus uh, had slaughtered the, the pig in the temple and the, the Maccabeans, Judas Maccabees, came up with an army and drove out the Seleucid army out of Israel. So they had about 50 to 80 years where they weren't under any foreign power at all. And so they celebrate that with Hanukkah. That's what Hanukkah is about. 
uh, that, that coincides with our Christmas. It's a remembrance of the time that the temple was profaned and then Judas Maccabees raised the army and but, they got rid of the foreign armies. But Jesus said that ain't it. That ain't Matthew it. Matthew 24 says it's coming again. Something worse. I was going to skip on this, but you guys want the revelation someone Because you said the Old Testament saints... They're going to come back to it and they're going to sit at the table. This is a marriage. Abraham. My question is, what kind of body are they in? I believe they'll be given the body that they're going to have in the millennium. I don't know for sure what kind of body it'd be, but it won't be like Christ because well, the church will have the body like well, Christ. Well, that's what I was going to ask you was, and I know God has the power to resurrect people, a net from a natural death because yeah. he did it with Lazarus and he sure. brought he resurrected back into his natural body. That was that was my question. Could he be doing that with them? He could through but DNA. I was just wondering about that. He could through D DNA. Uh, only he will glorify it to where they won't die. Yes, you're right. Correct. Some people who have asked me who don't believe like we do. Why is there a gap between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel? Shouldn't they have come together at one time? That's what they ask me. What's your response? James mentioned the verse earlier. It's because, he, because Messiah was cut off in the 69th week. Well, you got to understand, week. too, that remember when the children of Israel went into Babylonian captivity, that's when the clock for Israel basically... You know, God was dealing with Israel at that time under the under the bondage, which was about 483 years. And then there was a time when Cyrus, that, that was 70 years, Cyrus sent word that they could go back to the temple. And so when they went back to rebuild the city, that kicked in another seven weeks, which brought it to 183 years. Years which that leaves one week left. And the, the, so, so the answer is, is when God's not dealing with Israel, the clock stops. And, 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 and J. Dwight Pentecost and uh, Francis Schaeffer, the, the, the 100 years ago, Schaeffer, uh, Francis Berry Schaeffer, Dallas Theological Seminary, he said that, uh, that they had done the math and that the, the 483rd year was up on Palm Sunday. Yeah. The day that yeah. the day that Christ right entered Jerusalem, Jerusalem and everybody was saying, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the son of David, he that cometh in the name of the Lord, that it was exactly 483 years. So the best way to answer someone on that is when God is not dealing with Israel, the clock stops. <coughs> when God deals with Israel, the clock starts ticking again. So when the rapture takes place, the last week, the seventh week starts ticking again. I've also had it explained as a, as a football game called for, for lightning or bad weather. When they come back on the field, the clock starts where it stopped. Yeah. yeah. So that's basically what's happening. Okay, the two witnesses I've always thought would be Enoch and Elijah because they both were taken up. Um, but I understand that you think that may not be the case. The church is divided on that. But I'm right. Are you guys are you guys thinking on the same lines? I don't know. Are you thinking on the same lines as I am? You know, I I understand the argument for Enoch and Elijah. I think Moses and Elijah makes a little more sense to me as I've gotten older, uh, because when you read chapter eleven of uh, of Revelation and you look at the miracles that they perform, half of the signs that they do. Half of them are the signs that Moses did, and the other half are the signs that Elijah did when they were on the earth. And Enoch didn't have any of those signs. And the other thing that 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 uh, has led me to this conclusion, which is, it's uh, it's deduction. You know, I mean, we don't have any proof one way or the other. But it was it was it was Moses and Elijah who appears to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, the and they were, Peter was so impressed that he wanted to build three tabernacles, remember? Yeah. And isn't, that, isn't that just like a guy? You know, we're not going to worship. We're not going to get him a drink of water. We're going to go build something. Let's build him a house. 
<laughs> they're, they're both a picture of the law and the prophets as well, which okay. is what Israel is looking for in that time. They respect Moses as the law and Elijah as the prophets. And so it's a returning to that sort of a view after the rapture of the, the church. During the the time. description of Moses and Elijah more fits in Revelation chapter 11 than Enoch. If Enoch is a picture of the raptured church, we're not coming back to die. Right. I, I think Hebrews 9.27 is what most people get caught up but with. But that doesn't yeah, mean no. it has to be. It just means that that is an appointment to people. A whole church is going to escape that. And what we're talking about Moses, which we are, who fought over the body of Moses when, he, when God smothered Moses to death with Holy Ghost kisses? Who fought over the body? Satan. Lucifer fought over the body. He wanted the body of Moses. And Michael. Why did he want the body of Moses? I've seen a lot of dead people. I don't want their body. Right. Why did he fight over Moses? Because his dead body. I'll tell you why. His dead body wouldn't decompose. He'd been around God too much. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's good. Yeah. And God hid his body. Amen. So that they wouldn't worship that body. The children of Israel wouldn't worship it. He hid it. Because it was so preserved it wouldn't decompose. Boy, wouldn't the devil like to get a hold of something like that? Yeah. There's so many of these things we can't be dogmatic about. And, and, and so it's good, to, it's good that we talk about the main and plain stuff. But, it, you know, if it turned out to be Enoch and Elijah, I'm not going to be mad. Oh, I'm okay with it. <laughs> I'm going to be okay with it. But I, but, I, but I refuse to come back and die. Uh, and you, so who mentioned Lazarus? Was it you that mentioned Lazarus a while ago? The resurrection of Lazarus? Uh, yes, uh, we don't think about it much, but what about Lazarus' second funeral? Because they were looking to kill Lazarus. The last time we see Lazarus, the Pharisees had decided to kill him too because it was his fault that so many people believed on Jesus. And so that's, you find that in chapter 12 of the Gospel of John. they were going to kill him. They were going to kill him. And I, my thinking is this. If they found Jesus in the garden and killed him, then I bet they found old Lazarus too. They're going to kill Lazarus. I bet he said, ooh, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> He'd already had the worst done to him, so what's he worried about, right? I'm not, I'm not coming back here to die. I don't care what you say. I am not coming back here to die. Once I'm raptured, I'm living forever. If I get taken out of here without dying, I'm not coming back to die. Amen. We're, we're gonna, gonna quit. We're gonna come back and eat the way you said it the other night. We are gonna eat. We are gonna eat when we come back. We're gonna be at Waterburger either. <laughs> All right, we gotta quit. Do we I, gotta do this again next Sunday? I hate night? quitting. Are we doing this again next Sunday night? I think we are. are I don't think I'm gone? supposed I don't think I'm supposed to be anywhere. Well if you're gonna be gone, I'll make Josh do it, but I mean Josh, Josh, ought, here, Josh right? ought to do it anywhere, and then, then he can run down and do the questions, too, because he's young and has legs. He could do that. He's ambitious. I was sitting on a stool this morning, and they said, Pastor, how come you're sitting down? I said, well, because this, this stool got four legs, and I only got two. <laughs> we got to quit. My wife told me you went too long last Sunday night, and we did it again. They've already told all the stories to the children that they know. Yeah, I know. I know. Anyway, you want to do it again next Sunday? Yes, absolutely. Does anybody want us to do it again next Sunday? All right, we'll do it next Sunday. We'll, we'll see about getting into maybe Revelation. God bless you. Bit. We'll see what we're doing. Awesome. I'm excited. The Lord's coming soon. I am too. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to be dismissed in prayer. Amen. I would give an altar call, but the thing is, you know where to find your knees on the floor. Get there. You can call out to the Lord. Amen. By the way, I've decided that I dropped a quarter out there on the floor, actually with a penny, and I would have paid one of my grandkids a quarter to pick up the penny for me. <laughs> Because by the time I reached down and got it, I decided jumping off the bridge is not a wise idea at 70 years old. <laughs> and if you weren't here this morning, you don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, amen. All right, we're going to be dismissed in prayer. We're glad you came. Remember Bobby in prayer and Joyce. And I'm going to ask Brother Chris if he would dismiss us in prayer. <laughs>